Welcome back. The Defense Department's cyber and technology workforce has a roadmap for the future now after the recent 2025 Cyber Workforce Summit. One of the DOD leaders there was Katie Arrington performing the duties of the Chief Information Officer of the Department of Defense. Katie, welcome. Thanks for joining me. What's your takeaway after talking to the people in the room and the people that joined you virtually at that summit? It's good to be home. It's good to be home. Um, it was uh, inspirational, right, that, that coming back and giving people the art of the possible at their fingertips. That was, you know, the whole discussion that that Workforce Summit that FCA sponsored. It was phenomenal. And that we have really great people in federal government, and this is an opportunity for them to shine. It was, it was inspiring. And to speak with, um, you know, to speak a lot of jokes while we were there, of course, because I can only, you know, you got to add a little humor. Uh, General Stanton spoke after me, and uh, Alexi um, with the National Security Council spoke before me. He's six foot four. Um, and I brought the mic down, of course, for me because I'm four yeah. eleven. You're not six foot four. Oh no! But then, of course, I took it down even a notch further for Lieutenant General Stanton. Mm. Uh, just you know, let him know. <laughs> it's a ton of fun to be home. What is the most important thing when you are examining where the cyber workforce is inside the Pentagon now? Is first of all motivation, mm. right? And I think that the SecDef has brought back that that spirit of you know, the ethos of bringing it back. And these are people, you know, they're first line of defenders, right? And then the non-kinetic environment, that workforce, they're the ones that are fighting the non-kinetic aspects of, of everything that's coming at us. And the fact that the SecDef has brought the ethos of lethality and readiness and the warfighter to the priority, that it's a time of change and it's a needed time of change. And the secretary is leading us down a very ambitious path. I'm looking forward to the next few years of really making some, some impact because at the end of the day, at the, you know, and I said at the summit, that man or woman that is serving either CONUS or OCONUS, and they're banking on the fact that when they hit to make that weapon work or that, that radar work or, 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 it really is that non-kinetic cyber defender is the first line of defense. And without them, the kinetic attack will happen. So it was it was refreshing. I felt inspired by the crowd there and the speakers. It was a phenomenal opportunity. As you've been back in the building, you've had an opportunity, I imagine, to see where the department is going on one of the ambitious aspects of what you talked about, and that's zero trust implementation. Yes. Uh, to get to full implementation by fiscal 2027. What's your vision for getting from where you are today to wherever you, you decide you want to go on zero trust implementation. So first and foremost, right, partnerships. And we have an extraordinary partnership right now within the DOD. I, you know, being in the building prior and coming in now, um, the partnerships between all the CIOs really believing in it and wanting to get there, that's half the battle, right? And that they have really leaned in. We understand that zero trust is, you know, it's it's a framework, but it's also a culture, mm -hmm. right? Let's go back to Katie and, and back in, in when I was in the building before, I talked about cybersecurity as a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Zero trust is a cultural thing that, you know, you need to, to plan for the inevitable and do everything you can to reduce the risk. And the fact that everybody's embraced that and we have an expeditious time frame in which to get there, it's fuel, right? Because if you give government an opportunity or pause, right, it's, it's, it's a challenge that this is full force, we're driving in, we're going to get it done, and we're getting it done so the warfighter and the nation are secured. It's, it is refreshing, it's avant-garde in our world to be at this place, and I'm excited to be at the, you know, sitting in the seat and getting to see all the amazing work that's been done and directing where we need to go. There are two themes when I talk to folks in the department in particular, but also in the civilian agencies about zero trust. There are two kind of themes that I keep hearing and I wonder how they fit with your vision. One is, as you just said, zero trust is a culture and a strategy, not a tool. Correct. They don't expect to go buy some zero trust stuff and implement it and be finished. So that's one. And the other idea is folks talk about implementing it for mission delivery rather than because there's a mandate to do it absolutely. or because they have a strategy to, to do it. it okay, I, I get the answer to the question that already. That is absolutely Kate. it, right? There have been, you know, the, the first, uh, I had a town hall uh, the first few days of, of sitting in the seat and what I said to the team, it's, you know, change is never easy, right? But nothing in life you ever gain from change, it doesn't come without a cost, but it's needed and necessary. 
I don't work out. Let's not pretend that I do, <laughs> right? But if I were to go work out, again, you know, that, that muscle movement, it, it's painful. Mm. You feel sore, right? But you're so much better the next day for it. And right now what we're looking at and we're really taking with the zero trust culture, right? What are we doing? What is working? What isn't working? And how can we do it better, right? Because ultimately, it's our national security and, and our near peer adversary, China, is not backing down. And they have a culture of, you know, one team, one fight. And zero trust essentially is that. Culturally, one team, one fight. It's not just capability. It's mm. not just software. It's not just hardware. It's not just architecture. It's a cultural movement, which has been needed and necessary. And the, the fact that we have resourcing to be able to do it, we have the motivation, and we really have some extraordinary leaders in the building right now who are embracing this at the time of relevance, right? I talk a lot about, you know, compliance versus right, mm. right? You can be compliant, doesn't mean you're right. Mm -hmm. And it's the teams are leaning to, we want to do the right thing for the warfighter. And it's it, I just can't say enough positive things about the department right now. To that idea of one team, one fight, yeah. one of the things that you were known for um, in, in your first tour at the Pentagon was the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Uh, one of my friends messaged me on LinkedIn after you first posted that you were going back in at the very, very beginning and said, the CMC, CMMC lady is back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your reputation. What's your sense of how that has developed over the time since you've been in the building and how that fits in this one team, one fight concept? Well, I will, I will give uh, Miss Stacy Bosjanic, Mr. Buddy Dees, Miss Carrie Cardwell, Chris Carpenter, and the PMO shop, Diane Knight, has moved on, I believe, um, that they were determined to continue it and I thank my lucky stars every day and we should as a nation thank them for continuing it. The CMMC PMO has had hurdle after hurdle gone their way and they have excelled and I couldn't be prouder or happier to be back and to be here at the, you know, I say the christening, right? It's almost like the champagne bottle's just ready to go mm. and the fact that we have Army leaning in early and often. Um, I appreciate what the Army's doing. I think Secretary Driscoll, uh, you know, I'm a friend of his, he's, he's definitely taking the mantra of, you know, we're here to lead. And they put things, right, that, that play into this, right? The Army released a memo starting to put SBOM requirements, right, into their contracting, really looking at supply chain risk management. And in that scrim taxonomy that we developed in the department over the past few years, one of the key enablers of it is cyber, which is CMMC. Mm -hmm and that trust but verify. Um, so CMMC is moving, um, at, it's, it's moving forward. We are definitely embracing it as a cultural thing, right? As part of the zero trust framework. Um, the naysayers out there, um, you know, we, we have, it, there's been a lot of innovation on how do we help with the auditing process and make it less manual. That's absolutely happening. And we have, you know, providers coming in to help the small and medium sized businesses really get that hurdle. Um, but, you know, we still have that challenge point was from back in the day, right? When that first law went into place in 2014 and was, you know, the 7012 clause in DFAR, when it was instituted in 70, 2017 for all defense contractors, nobody really understood. And I don't say it was out of malice, right? No one understood. Now we understand, and we've had so many companies going through the joint surveillance program, getting DIBCAC certified early, right? A lot of our primes have gone through there. Now it's our time to really focus in on how do we assist the small and medium-sized businesses, and I live by this mantra. Um, I will teach a man to fish any day of the week, but I can't give you a fish. And that's where we are right now. Let's, how do we get the industry and the right tools in place? And even in the beginning of the CMMC, I said, you know, it's, we are going to have issues that no doubt, right? But this is something that is necessary. We do not fight a war alone, Francis. We fight it with the dib. And if they are not protected to take care of themselves, which they need to be. That's what the NIST 171 was created for, was the defense industrial base to be able to defend, not fully completely to a nation state attack. That's almost, that is something that, thank gosh, we have Cybercom and Army Cyber and all the 10th Fleet. But they have to be able to do, I would say, zero trust, right? That's the, the methodology. So once everybody gets level set, um, there will be some growing pains and we'll have to get through them, but there always are growing pains. 
and it's just an opportunity where we brought industry in, we're still talking to industry, and I can't wait for the first contract iteration. We'll talk more about the Dib when we continue in a moment. My conversation with Katie Arrington continues in just a moment. FedGov Today with Francis Rose. We'll be right back. Because where we are right now in Gen AI and software development, it's really about code assistance. Mm -hmm. It's about human in the loop, which I think is really valuable to your first question around compliance and security. So humans always involve, but what we want to do is we want to improve that for the future. Back, the Defense Information Systems Agency says it's laying the groundwork for the next generation cloud computing contract. It's using the lessons learned from the first iteration of the joint warfighting cloud contract. More on that with Katie Arrington performing the duties of the Chief Information Officer of the Department of Defense. Uh, thank you for sticking around to continue the conversation. What are some of the lessons that you think will apply to the new cloud contract? And what's your vision for how the department will deploy it, Katie? Oh, well, absolutely zero trust, right? Yeah. What we've learned from here to there and the fact that, you know, the cloud providers are using our configuration and they're basing it off of, you know, it's, it's a partnership. You know, mm. bringing industry and collaborating with industry is critical. Um, that's happened. Um, as we look at JWCC next, that's that's what we call it. Um, the lessons learned, zero trust, you know, bringing in industry best practices combined with the requirements that the department needs. Um, it's been it's been a wild ride, and we learned a lot. Um, there's more to come um, as we look at better ways to help bring the dib. You know, innovation moves so rapidly in the commercial sector. And they, they've taught us a lot, and we've taught them some things, mm. right? That the way we protect the nation is a little bit differently. And that collaboration has created our next iteration, and we're looking forward to it. You have talked about the DIB about 5,000 times so far mm. in this conversation. Why is that so important, and what's your vision for improving the way that the DIB interacts with the department and vice versa? Well, number one, I, you know, as I said before, we don't fight wars alone, mm. right? And the DIB is our, our partner with everything that we do. So listening to our partners is important. Um, and when we look at the Valley of Death, there's going to be some new things. Um, our deputy has just gotten in his seat. Um, I, there are some programs that we've been working on that he'll be releasing in the next few weeks that really are going to flatten out the Valley of Death mm -hmm. about bringing innovation in, using you know third-party risk as, as a trust but verify um, to help us with the due diligence process. That's a big problem set that we've had. And, you know, the industry has changed so much since COVID, right? There's just been such an, a, 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 I would say, the momentum of using AI, large language modeling, LLM, has changed the way due diligence is done. Mm. And that's going to, you know, affect the way that we do business in the future. So having that, that, that iterative, you know, taking innovation from industry, how do they do it? We look at banking and the financial industries, the healthcare industries, best practices and bring them into the building. The DIB are the same DIB that we use, right? People forget that we have Defense Health Agency, that we have the VA. We're, we're using these same partners and being able to learn from them has been huge. So we definitely want more non-traditionals, mm -hmm. right? We want to get out of the stovepipe of doing, you know, business in the, the this bucket, right? And looking at new capabilities and new entities to come forward, but vetting to make sure that they're truly the entities that they say that they are, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that our adversaries have been, you know, influencing and interceding and disrupting our supply chains. Um, they, you know, they're purposefully going after the DIB in you know in ransomware attacks and etc so it's we need to we need to be able to provide them you know this is the direction this is the methodology this is how we want you to go about things but we definitely want them more in the building it's you know the pendulum swings mm -hmm. and right now it's we want the commercial innovation and we want it now and and we want to figure out you know the sec def and the president right that ethos that the warfighter is what is critical and national security is as at at risk and let's make sure we're giving everything that we've got. We're about a decade into the idea of trying to bring more commercial innovation into the Defense Department uh, through the defense industrial base. What's your sense of what the missing links still are to be able to then address them 
to maximize that, that well, innovation. Well, the secretary in his first few days, you know, revitalized the software acquisition pathway, mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, I helped create. The, the cyber component of that was what I did the first time in the building. And understand that virtually everything has a software component. And moving and leaning in and saying, this is an innovative way to look at it. And an, for acquisition, it definitely makes it different. Mm -hmm. um, so immediately, I think that was one of the secretary's first or second actions, like let's move out on the software acquisition pathway. The deputy will be following up with some innovative ways on software, how we look at it. Uh, that's coming very, very soon. I'm not going to steal his thunder. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we're w working on things about how do we take what we have and understanding that there's there's always going to be a risk. And how do we help industry mitigate that risk and, and stay functioning? Because the adversary, you know, this is electronic warfare. 101, right? Once they find one way to, to exfil a thing, you've got to plug that hole, they're going to find another way. And our requirements need to have that. You know, one of the things I think that we're really going to lean into is how do you get dynamic requirements? That, you know, we have contracting, you know, five, ten years, and how do we get the requirements right so that we can be innovative and move at the time of relevancy, not at the time the requirement was created? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, our next chapter. What do you think the biggest barriers are going to be to be able to get from where you see things today to that vision that you just described, Katie? So it's, you know, buying down the tech debt hmm. and moving legacy and collapsing like defense business systems and getting the functional community, which I think is the key, right, and the requirement builder combined together. Mm -hmm. And once we, we get that, and we're starting to make process, I, you know, I give a lot of credit to the Navy, um, from the CIO to the comptroller, they really are looking at it very uniquely. And that I think is one thing that we definitely need to look at is, are the functionals understanding what the requirement means? Mm -hmm. Because it's not you know, it's hard when you're trying to describe a capability that you yet to be designed right to get the requirement right and those two fuse together and give you capability i think that's where our next real big point of of impact is right now is getting those two to communicate and they're doing it and you mentioned the navy comptroller and i'm not i'm, I'm not slighting the army and the air force but I, the the idea that the comptrollers are involved in all of these t conversations is important for any number of reasons, Absolutely. not least of which is everybody has awareness as to what's what's necessary for audit success and, and so on. And that's what we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. and why the comptrollers are critical in understanding how, you know, the requirements on, you know, a business system were, were created. We want to provide the taxpayer a full, transparent audit. Um, but you, you, the way we've built our, our acquisition over the past 70 years, um, innovations come in and we've kind of bolted it in. Mm -hmm. Now it's a, a moment we're looking back and saying, okay, these are the requirements. Everybody needs to stay in, and I'll give Ms. Jenkins the credit, she says, put them in the box, right? If we can get everybody in the box and then understand the customization that needs to be done, but the standards need, need to be across the board for everyone, interoperability is key, um, the available to have zero trust. So I think as we look at the tech debt buy down, right, old legacy systems, how do we integrate them? That facilitates the zero trust. And are we spending the tech debt money smart, right? If we're gonna tr put a, I say put a Band-Aid on a system that needs to shut down this year, because mm. the idea is that we want to have all of our business systems laying flat by the end of 26 for an audit in 27. Mm -hmm. And that is fully what we are committed to doing for the taxpayer. We, we deserve a, a transparent audit and the ability to pass an audit and explain where the money is. We have about a minute left. Uh, when you look at where the building is today, in particular the CIO portfolio, versus where it was when you left, what's better? What's dramatically different? You referenced artificial intelligence earlier, and I oh, imagine that's a huge factor. Yes, I mean, the AI has definitely got its place, and, and it's, you know, how do we use it, though? That's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the issues when I was in the building before I was CISO a and s and it was an acquisition, and how do we get it? In the CIO seat, I'm seeing it from a different lens. Mm -hmm. um, the problems are still somewhat the same. It's a different approach. I think with AR, a, I'm sorry, AI and LLM, we are definitely making a, a, a turn. Um, but yet again, you know, we've got to make sure that, I, I say this and please humor me, garbage in, garbage out. The right data needs to be put in. That's what we're talking about, making that box, making mm -hmm. sure the right data is going in and that data has cleansed, that it's needed, it has validity. We don't want to spend money on data we're never going to use. 
And that's what, you know, we're taking every penny that we're spending like it's our own and it's the taxpayer's dollars and we want to make sure that we're doing our utmost best to provide national security, but also in the same vein that we're doing the best budget restraints for the taxpayer. It's great to have you on the program.